perspective as well. So that's what, let's try to look through the patient's perspective as well. So what tends to happen? As we all know, heart failure is a chronic problem, is a chronic condition. So what happens is initially there will be acute problems. Patient may need uh, the admission and all, due to which with time what is going to happen is progression will be happening. And then later on what is happening is the quality of the life will start decreasing as well. Those episodes will be start becoming more and more frequent and then these problems will continue to happen. And of course with time whenever the progression starts to happen the mortality will start increasing and the function and what is called as the quality of life will start to decrease as well. And those episodes are going to become more and more frequent. So when we try to look on a global basis, what happens is we can see it very clearly as well that especially in some of the Asian countries, they tend to have a very high percentage rate. For example, even in Asian developed countries like Singapore, if you try to look, it is like 4.5% or Malaysia, 6.7%. But when you try to see in the US, like it's 1.9% or even in Europe overall basis as well, it's nearly 1.2% itself. So, but in the Asian population, it is three to four times higher. So it's really unfortunate, for, although even in Middle East, for example, countries like Oman, the incidence rate is very low, isn't it? So, what is happening is with time, we all know what is going to happen is we are expecting uh, better longevity. So we expect those people to live longer. And then what is happening is the risk factors, they are becoming more and more common. They are, the, uh, the prevalence is increasing much more. And also what is happening is earlier days, what used to happen at least like, you know, 40, 50 years back, if someone used to have a myocardial infarction, most of the times those patients used to die. But now what is happening is those, most of those patients are, they are having a better survival rate. So this is what is, what we are trying to do is, we know such kind of number of such kind of patients is going to increase. So what are we going to do? So we have to do is, that we have to try to take care of those risk factors and especially for example in a country like India what is happening so what is happening is it's a huge population India has a huge population and in fact one-fourth of those world coronary artery disease patients are Indians the percentage of patients as well who are suffering from hypertension or even the diabetes as well it's very huge and also there is a very big number of patients who are having rheumatic heart disease. So what is happening is when we try to look about the epidemiology, so what is the reason for having a high percentages of people having heart failure actually? So what happens is not only the pre-transitional diseases are present, but also the risk factors are there, which tend to almost double the risk of the heart failure. So, uh, in fact, on an overall basis, there's the rising prevalence of heart failure in India. It's a multiple prong factor. And what is the reason for that is, of course, so the coronary heart, heart disease itself in incidence factor is quite a lot high. And later on, when you try to see even for the hypertension alone as well, it's, as you can see, it's in billions, in fact. So one point up to two million, in fact. Similarly, for diabetes alone as well, as you all know, so India is going to become the diabetes capital of the world as well by 2020. Similarly, with uh, increase in the per capita income and better influential capacity as well. So what is happening is the, uh, the undernutrition is also there, overnutrition is also there. The overnutrition is the one which is leading to obesity and it is increasing further. And as I was told, telling you, so one of the common uh, mistakes which I always come across, everyone tends to say is that the problem is due to the rheumatic heart disease. No, rheumatic heart disease is present, but not always so much so that. So what happens is the problem is due to the, they also 
rheumatic heart disease is present along with the coronary artery disease or hypertension as well but what is happening is still majority of such patients are still having is hypertension or maybe even coronary artery disease but not coronary artery disease uh, but not rheumatic heart disease but we need to understand once the patient is already having rheumatic heart disease almost every fifth of the rhd patient is going to get a heart failure with not so high mortality rate mortality rate is all the low but chances of developing heart failure is very high so what about the coronary artery disease coronary artery disease incidence is very high but it has a slightly higher heart failure rate of going up to around 5% hypertension we all know like almost every third or the fourth person especially in the urban population is having the hypertension although in rural population as well it is there but almost like one in every six or one in every, in every 10 patients is going to have that and once someone has a hypertension almost five to ten percent of those patients will be getting the heart failure in fact so the projected burden for heart failure is quite a lot high almost nearly one percent of the total population as we all know the myocardial infarction so a lot of people are able to survive that thrombolytics are there pci centers are there as well so the percentages of them, especially more than 19 years of age, is increasing as well, quite a lot. And when you try to see what is happening is the heart failure burden, secondary to the myocardial infarction, is increasing day by day. It is increasing. The percentage of the population as well is increasing, in fact. And when you are trying to see the heart failure due to hypertension itself, it's just mind-boggling because the hypertension incidence itself is quite a lot and when you try to see for the overall annual mortality as well just for the heart failure it is an independent factor as well for not only for the morbidity but also for the mortality and that's why once the heart failure tends to uh, start for any kind of patients it tends to just boom over there so especially what is happening in the Asian population, I would say, or spe more specifically like Indian population. So what is happening is we tend to see these Indian patients are much more younger, up to almost 20%. The mortality is almost 10% higher, 10 times higher. So for example, the in-hospitality, in-hospital mortality for an average patient is like almost 4%. Then for those Indian patients, it's almost 31%. Similarly, when you are trying to see for the even after post discharge mortality is just nine percent for on a global basis, but for the Indian patient it's almost twenty six percent. So, on an overall basis, if you want to summarize, what is the main characteristic of heart failure patients who are there in India? Is they tend to be really younger, and they have a high, very high, I would say, in hospital and even after discharge mortality as well. So this is a beautiful slide which is trying to summarize all these, uh, not only those risk factors, those outcomes and how about those associated coronary artery disease as well. So South Asia, especially India is already being said as the world, not only diabetic capital, but also the cardiac disease capital as well. So now coming to what about the impact of the heart failure admission? So what happens is, as we all know, initially the acute episodes may be minimum, not so frequent, but with time it starts increasing, especially those people whose age is higher, for example those people who are ages more than 65 years, it is one of the number one cause, so the maximum, the most frequent cause for the admission of those elderly people actually as well. And then what happens is, in fact, once someone has been diagnosed with heart failure, 20% of those patients are going to die in their first year itself. And later on, what happens is, especially, uh, as I had already said, it, they are at a higher risk for the repeated hospitalization as well. So what happens is, almost 25% of those patients more than 65 years are re-hospitalized within just a month of their discharge as well. So what is happening is the percentage of such populations tend to increase quite a lot. 
So when you are trying to see for the impact of hospitalizations, so after hospitalization has been done, the heart failure patients may never regain their prior quality of life. And yes, the risk of mortality tends to increase further one after the other, the other, other. It is more like a vicious cycle you can think of. And yes, up to 80% of the direct costs are due to hospitalization. So what about its impact on the quality of life? So the heart failure can severely affect the patient's social capacity and also emotional health. In fact, 63% of the heart failure patients report symptoms consistent with depression. And we need to know as well, especially in cardiology, not only these kind of patients, they do have uh, not only uh, depression as well, uh, they may even also be having suicidal tendencies. Uh, so not only those heart failure patients, they tend to have such kind of problems. But I think we all need to understand as well, the patients who are having their uh, myocardial infarctions or coronary artery disease as well, they also can have a higher risk for depression in fact. So what about the impact on quality of life? So the overall impact on quality of life is the heart failure, uh, you know, so what will happen is almost uh, uh, out of if you are trying to consider at least two to three patients out of that at least one definitely what is going to happen is you know they will be struggling they will be feeling a little bit alone they will be not so comfortable even to uh, you know to speak with their family members to their near and dear ones or even to their friends as well and in fact more than 60% they will be having difficulties with the recreation of pastimes or even sports or any kind of hobbies as well when they have been asked to do so. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged problem actually. So it's not just one or two things, you know, the symptoms, even on an emotional basis. And once these emotional problems start to happen and all, it can be not so good in fact for the patient. So what about the effect on the mortality? So uh, once the onset of the heart failure has uh, started, so they tend to have a poor prognosis as well. Poor prognosis in what way? In the sense uh, that 30% of such patients tend to die in the hospital. And 40% of the patients will either die Otherwise, re-hospitalize in the six months itself. So it's a huge, huge number, in fact. And as I had said, it normally in our common life, we tend to think that you know, uh, cancer is most deadly disease, right? So, but when we try to see for these numbers, surprisingly, heart failure, uh, five-year death rate is almost fifty percent. So someone has an onset of heart failure, so 50% of those patients are going to die. Although leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, colon and rectal cancer as well, they tend to have a higher rate for mortality, but not as so high as the heart failure. So heart failure is literally like a silent killer. Hello, can you all hear me? Okay, 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 good, good, good. I, I thought there was some disconnection, I don't know why. Okay, so once you know about all these things, similarly, the mortality is, so you all already know, almost once you have diagnosed them with heart failure in the five years itself, 50% of them are going to die. So this is such a big figure, isn't it? So normally we tend to think cancer or something else as well. So that is one of the reasons as well I always say like this, we need to have more empathy for those kind of patients or those kind of people when you are putting them or labeling them a diagnosis of heart failure. You really need to be slightly bit, a bit more careful in fact. Even the NIHA, the NIHA score, New York Heart Association scoring as well, when you try to train those kind of patients into 
class 1, 2, 3, 4 as well. So what happens is 34% of such patients, even if they are having one or two, they will die in just three years. And if someone is in advanced stages of NIHA class 3 and 4, in just three years, almost 42% of those patients are going to die. Isn't it a very high rate? So we have to be a little bit careful. And what is the most common cause of death for those kind of patients? So what is called a sudden cardiac death. And what happens is almost sudden cardiac death is the cause for almost 45%. 45% of such patients. So even if someone is having mildly symptomatic as well, they do have that risk as well. So what about the clinical progression? So what happens is, it does impact uh, not only the patient themselves, the doctors who are associated with them, the caregivers, or the people who are paying for the cost as well. But in fact, there are a lot of non-fatal clinical worsening as well for the heart failure patients. So what happens is, it tends to affect the functional capacity, but also the quality of life for the patients, in fact. And it also requires intensification of the oral medications, hospitalization, medical or surgical interventions as well. Therefore, the heart failure therapies should improve not only morbidity, the clinical stability, but also the mortality as well. And that is what is the definition of a standard molecule. And that is what I think you all will remember, which we discussed about the various therapies which should be used for the heart failure. So I think you all will remember already that heart failure progression is happening due to the neurohormonal imbalance. Neurohormonal why? So what is happening is there are two mechanisms. One is the RAS or the sympathetic nervous system which is leading to vasoconstriction, sodium retention, fibrosis and hypertrophy. And on the other side is the natriuretic peptides. They tend to have a Protective action. So what are the protective action is? Vasodilation, natriuresis, renin suppression, aldosterone suppression, antifibrosis, and even antihypertrophy as well. So what is happening is, so uh, as you all know, there are three types of natriuretic peptides which comes in our body. A, B, C. A is for the atrial, B is for the brain, and C is for the kidney or the renal one. Or the blood vasculation. So, so once we understand it, CNS leads to the SNS inhibition, the heart, the ANP will, uh, the effect will be is maladaptive cardiac hypertrophy because the heart really has to struggle quite a lot for those increased pressure for that, and which will cause fibrosis. And from the kidneys, we already said it, and the blood vasculature. That's how the hypertension and all will be happening. So then what is happening is, there's also augmentation of the natriuretic peptide. And what is the mechanism is, because there are two already established targets, we all know, the sympathetic nervous system or the RAS as well. So, but what is happening is, recently what our focus has been changing to ARNI. So what was ARNI, which we spoke about just two days back, do you all remember? What did we speak about? Arnie. Increased tension receptor and hypoglycemic inhibitors. Wonderful. At least someone remembers. I'm so glad. Great, great, super. So this was so this is what we are trying to maintain a neurohormonal taking away those patients from the imbalance. We are trying to make it much more balanced. Okay. Versus from the neurohumoral inhibition to the neurohumoral modulation. And how are we doing it? trying to balance the vasoconstriction, the anti-natriuretic, the promitotic effect, or mediators as well. So we are trying to take away those negative factors, and that's how is, comes the role of these ARNI. So what it is, as I had said it already in my last session, that it is actually a pro-drug drug combination of Sacubitril and Valsartan. So even sacubitril is actually present in a form of a prodrug, which will be 
uh, getting activated and it will be getting released in the form of a sacubitrol and then the al sartan is of course there and then it tends to release so we have already we are already already aware of what are those things what are those drugs which have a proven rule as well now we will try to gain a little bit insight about this molecule so what uh, what is so unique about this molecule what are the precautions which we all have to take care of you know uh, how i go to deal with such kind of patients so as i was telling you so this actually contains is lcz696 which is sacubitril valsartan okay so it tends to there are different strengths for this which is 50 100 200 milligrams and it has been shown uh, to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and also the hospitalization for the heart failure patients even if they are in any of the states so for example like the NIHA class 2 to 4 or any of those patients are with reduced induction traction so how many of uh, you are using this combination actually anyone yes sir sometimes sir so when do you use it um, Sir, see, in CHF patient. Okay, when? Uh, at the time of discharge. Okay, so I will try to give you some little bit of insight. So ideally what you should always have done is, you sh should have always start, already started those patients on ACE and beta, or uh, if possible, in addition to the beta blocker as well. So what are the other drugs which has shown proven benefit for the heart failure patients. Sir, epinephrine. Good. And what else? What were the Okay. And what were the other medications which we spoke about last time? Hmm. What else? Beta blockers. Good. And beta blockers. Good. DC inhibitors. Good. And good. Digoxin, no. Doctor Hussain. Digoxin. No. Digoxin doesn't have any mortality or morbidity benefit. Ifebradin. Okay, and this was the other molecule as well. Yeah, sacubitril valsartan. So this is a little bit new molecule. What happens is once you have already up titrated the dosage of ACE inhibitor or beta blocker also really gone to the very high level as well. Still, you have to wait for a few months. And still, if you're not seeing much of improvement, then you may stop the ACE inhibitor, for example, at least for 36 hours minimum. Minimum is 36 hours, and then you may start from the lower dosage if uh, uh, try to avoid the hypertension and the contraindications as well, which I'm going to show you in the further slides. So, yes, so initially you have to, you must always try to target for almost a dosage of 200 milligrams. Although the recommended dose is 100 milligram. And you may also start from the 50 milligram. And as I had said, if someone is already on the ACE inhibitors, try to give a gap of almost 36 hours. And you have to double the dosage every two to four weeks and gradually. You have to keep on taking uh, time as well. Uh, and as I said, it up titrate gradually, slowly. No need to be too much in a hurry. So for the renal impairment, good thing is no need for dose adjustment at all. Although for hepatic impairment, someone's liver function is problematic is there. So then what you have to do is, you have to start from the 50 milligram and then you have to keep on seeing as well. But yes, if there is a patient who has severe hepatic impairment, you should not use this combination. So what are the contraindications in which, for example, you should not use this combination at all. If there is a patient with hypersensitivity, you know, allergic to ACE inhibitor or ARBs as well, and I had said it, always minimum is 36 hours. Till that time, you should not give. Someone has had an angioedema as well. Angioedema, as you all know, it can be quite a lot common with the ACE inhibitor or the ARBs as well. If someone is already on aliskarinin, okay, or someone is pregnant as well, so you should not be using this. And the thing is, 
when are you going to be more cautious? In the cautious in the sense, so if someone is already on the dual block and of the RAS is not advised. So for example, ACE inhibitor you're already giving and then you're trying to put them on this as well. No, that's not good. 36 hours gap is a standard thing which you all should know. Aliskanin, I already said it as well, try to avoid it. Although with ARB, uh, you should not give at all because this already contains and as I said it, so what is happening is because there will be dual blockage of the RAS system, which is not at all good. So what are the various conditions in which you have to be a little bit cautious? So as I already said, yes, hypotension can happen and if, uh, in one of the slides as well, I had shown you up to 14% of the times, even in the study as well, paradigm heart failure study, it was shown that hypotension may occur. So that's why that is the time when you have to do a little bit dose adjustment for the dosage of the diuretics and also the anti-hypertensive drugs and which you are giving as well. Hypertension can sometimes persist. So if it is persisting even after this, so then you can try to lower the dosage of the uh, medicine which you are giving. And yes, try to correct also the sodium uh, or the electrolytes as well or the volume upload as well. Okay. So what happens is you also, whenever you are trying to put a star, a patient on this medicine, you always need to be careful as well that, you know, if uh, so someone may be on diuretics or the potassium supplements, it may cause hyperkalemia. Okay. So similarly, if there's a clinically significant hyperkalemia occurring, so measures as reducing dietary potassium or adjusting the dose of concomitant medication should be ideally considered. And monitoring of the serum potassium is recommended in fact, especially in patients with risk factors such as severe renal impairment, diabetes, hypoaldosteronism, or even someone is, if patient is receiving a high potassium diet. For the angioedema, as I had already said, if someone develops a angioedema, you should always stop this combination and should not re-administer at all. Better to, uh, you may think of something else as well. And has also been seen, uh, especially in the US or the Western population where blacks may be there. So they are having a higher risk to develop such kind of uh, angioedemas actually. And as I had said it, renal artery stenosis or someone is having, you know, uh, impaired renal function. You need not reduce the dosage, but you need to be a bit careful for that. Similarly, for the pregnancy, uh, it has not been studied, but it's not advisable as well. It's not so advisable, I wouldn't say. So if there's a, someone who is in the age-bearing uh, or child-bearing potential, I wouldn't advise them to be started on this, actually. So you have to be a little bit cautious as well. Although, and similarly, if uh, there is a lady, a uh, woman who is already lactating or, you know, feeding the, sorry, so feeding the baby as well. So it has not been studied, but it may not be advised. It should not be advised. You have to be really cautious, I would say. So now about the drug, adverse drug reactions, I think we are, have already spoken about it. The most common ones are like the hyperkalemia, hypotension, or even cough or dizziness or renal failure may also happen. Or sometimes orthostatic hypotension may also happen. Angioedema, as I already said it, it does have interactions with some of the other medications as well. So for example, Whenever you're trying to use the aliskarinin, especially in the patients with diabetes or if with ACE inhibitor. And similarly, as I had said it, if someone is on already on ACE inhibitor, try to give at least a gap of minimum is 36 hours. Okay. So you really have to, and especially if someone is already on potassium sparing diuretics or, or you know, MRAs as well, like spironolactone, triamterene or amyloride or 
potassium supplements as well or salt substitutes containing potassium so they will be having a higher risk for hyperkalemia similarly if someone is also on NSAIDs non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as well like the COX-2 inhibitors or the rifampin or ritonavir so you have to be really careful for such kind of patients so are you having any questions so far? Sir, what happened with NSAID infuse? Hmm. So NSAID, so what is the mechanism? What happens is, as I had already said it, uh, not only it can damage, because you're, you're going to, so what will be happening is also, it may also cause dual RAS blockage as well, and it can also increase the chances of hyperkalemia in child. So that is one of the reasons as well. So it is not advised. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions? So it's a great molecule, no doubt about it. This combination nowadays, I know uh, a lot of different companies are marketing these uh, molecules, wonderful molecules under different brand names. But you need to know how to use it wisely. Otherwise, uh, they say. Even a boon in a wrong hand is a bane. Means, if you don't use a good product wisely, it can become cause problems as well. If you don't use fire wisely, it can burn the house as well. So it's like this. So that's why you need to be a little bit cautious when you are using this wonderful molecule as well. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sir, uh, when we have to advise, uh, means according to the ejection fraction, sir, when we have to advise this tablet, sir? So, ideally, as I had said it, rather than ejection fraction, it, if it is reduced, that is the time you should think for. And you should try to see for in terms of the NIHA class as well. How much is the NIHA classification? If it is two or three or four as well, you can always think for. So the clinical symptoms is always one of the most important factors. And reduced ejection fraction. It is not like this someone is having, you know, 45%, 50%, and then you are thinking of starting them on this combination. No. So if someone is really symptomatic, ejection fraction is less than, you know, 35% or even up to 37% or 30% as well, then yes, you can think for starting this okay any more questions you can use the chat chat box as well so hopefully now after this session you guys are going to be much more, more confident uh, if you yeah. have any questions, you can check with Dr. Navendra. We have Dr. Hussain, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Harika, Sudhir, everyone is there. Do you have any questions? You please check with Dr. Navendra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no questions, then we'll stop the session for today. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. It will be more interesting. Session is more interactive today. Yeah, thank right. So much, Doctor. Right. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.